I've been getting a lot of email lately asking me if the conflict in Israel could become a regional conflict. Now, I am not a geopolitical guy. Uh, Peter Zion does a way better job on that than I do. Heck, Pirawan does a better job, and Donut Operator could probably do a better job than me when it comes to geopolitics. I do weapons, I do equipment, I do tactics, I do intelligence. But you can kind of use that to gauge how a regional war might not necessarily result from this conflict or what it could look like if it did happen. So this video is going to cover how a regional conflict is unlikely, but what it might look like if a regional conflict did break out. A couple of things before I get started. I am totally self-funded. This is my literal job. So if you've got $5, consider joining my Substack. Uh, you can get to it from the description below or get a t-shirt from Bunker Branding like my Department of the Boat People hoodie, which is great for a cold day in Washington, D.C. like this. It all goes to support the channel. So remember that old slogan, uh, suppose they gave a war and nobody came? It was big during the Vietnam War. It was on bumper stickers. It was a movie with Ernest Borgnine. And it was one of those hippie sentiments that's easy for people who don't live under communism to say, right? What if they gave a war and nobody came? Well, what if they gave a war and nobody could get there logistically? You see, the whole purpose of a war is to use physical violence to bend an actor to your will. It's kind of like MMA, but on a grander scale. You keep punching until you knock that other guy out or you put them in a submission hold. So in order to make that happen, you have to destroy the adversary's ability to fight and then occupy the physical ground, the, the enemy's territory. Capture enough territory and you win. Nobody can ever bomb their way to victory. And this is kind of why insurgencies are so difficult to fight, because you don't have a nation state or a territory with an industrial heartland or a single actor to bend to your will. In an insurgency, you have multiple leaders and other wolves will rise when you destroy them. I mean, I can think of hundreds of examples of successful insurgencies, but I can think of maybe five counterinsurgencies. Uh, the British in Malaysia during the 1950s, the Troubles in Northern Ireland, the FARC in Colombia, the Philippines and the New People's Army, and maybe the surge uh, in like the 2000s, the mid-2000s, uh, 2008, the, the Sunni awakening. Um, you would consider that an ex a successful counterinsurgency. And that's really only because the Sunnis woke up and went, oh, wow, we have something to gain from this, you know, politically, if we are actually part of the peace process. So uh, since you can't bomb your way to victory, you have to take and hold ground. So in order for Israel to be truly defeated, you have to occupy the country. Now, there's a number of reasons why this would be difficult. The first is the composition of the potential adversaries in the region. There's basically four kinds of armies. You have expeditionary armies, which have the capability to deploy and sustain at scale. There's only four of them, the US, Great Britain, France, and Russia. And to a lesser extent, maybe China in a couple of years. Then there are defensive armies, which tend to be most of the armies in Europe. They're purely for defensive purposes, although they do have some expeditionary capability, but that's mainly for humanitarian um, expeditions. Then you have internal security armies. They are basically the police force for the country. Most of the armies of South America and Africa are internal security armies. Then you have palace guard armies. They are designed to keep the current political regime in power. Most of the armies of the Middle East are palace guard armies, with the exception of Turkey, Iran, and maybe Egypt. I mean, look at Syria. The whole purpose of the Syrian army is to keep Bashar al-Assad in power. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven, right? Now, there is a quote you tend to hear a lot. Min al-Nahi, il abari satakuna, filistin, huratan. And that, it's a fun phrase to say because of the alliteration and the rhyming, and it works just as well in English. It means, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. But in order for that to happen... In order for Palestine to be free from the river to the sea, the Israelis will all have to be murdered or evicted from Israel. Now, there is a precedent for this, and it was done by the Israelis. It was called the Nakba. 
which is Arabic for the catastrophe, al-Nakba. So basically, during Israel's War of Independence, Jewish militias created this Palestinian refugee crisis that we see today by driving the Palestinians from their homes. Remember that scene in Army of Darkness where Ash Williams says, Good. Bad. I'm the guy with the gun. He's not wrong. Usually the person with the gun makes the rules. So in order for there to be an equivalent in Israeli Nakba, you have to physically occupy that land and either kill or evict every single Israeli on it. Now do you understand why Israel has conscription? And the Israelis saw this movie back in the 1940s in the original black and white, and they're not looking forward to the colorized reboot. So they're going to be the guy with the gun. So this means that in order for Israel to be defeated in detail, which is what you would need in order to create this from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free prophecy, you would need to invade with outside forces. If you want to get theoretical, Israel can probably field an army of maybe 5.5 million if they use people from the age 15 to 65. Although this would mean putting every single Israeli, male, female, Christian, Druze, Muslim, and Jew into uniform. So maybe if we knock back it to, to every male and female under 50, we get maybe 5 million capable of service. Now, if you take that old adage of an attack ratio of uh, three to one for attackers, and honestly, preferably you want five to one, that means anyone who wants to defeat Israel needs at least 15 million troops. To put that into perspective, during World War II, the United States military was about 16 million personnel total. That's everyone, Marines, Navy, Army. So, if the Arab world wants to defeat Israel, they are going to have to perform a military operation that rivals the U.S. contribution to World War II with a similar industrial base. Can you imagine the logistical tale for an operation involving 15 or so million Arab soldiers trying to enter and defeat Israel? Now that kind of makes that whole from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, sounds like something your stoner friend would say when they're high. And now that you understand the logistical hurdles, you have to think about the political hurdles. For every soldier that an Arab nation sends to fight in Israel, you have one less soldier that can protect your regime at home. Remember, Hamas started as an offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood, which started in Egypt. There's a reason why Egypt and Jordan don't want Palestinian refugees. There's also a reason why Palestinian refugees in Lebanon can't own homes and are barred from working in certain professions. Would the nations surrounding Israel go to war over a people that they treat pretty poorly themselves? Now here's another crappy thing. The, the one thing that unifies the Arab world, and I have to include the Turks and Iranians uh, and Egyptians, even though technically none of those people are Arab, the one thing that unifies the, the Arab world or the Middle East is that people hate the treatment of the Palestinians under de facto Israeli occupation. It is a system of apartheid, and it sucks for the Palestinians, but... There may be a reason why so many Arab nations just give the Palestinians enough aid to keep them poor, but not so much that they can turn that little section of Gaza or the West Bank into paradise. And that reason may be this. As long as you have another group that unites you in hate, maybe your own people won't look at your leadership and wonder why you're not fulfilling their needs. Look at the Mexican border crisis in the U.S. We could fix that tomorrow with immigration reform. But the Democrats need the votes from the kind of coastal citizens who aren't affected by immigration, and Republicans need a Democratic failure to point to. So it actually makes political sense for neither side to fix the problem. Because as much as it sucks to say it, the migrants are the ones who suffer, and they can't vote. So in a way, as horrible as it sounds... I think many Arab governments kind of need the Palestinian people to live in misery because it distracts their own citizens from thinking about their own miserable lives. Even the most military competent nation in that area of the world, which is probably Turkey, would have trouble logistically supplying their troops in Israel without NATO's help. 
and Iran, which has a, a competent military, they just don't have the logistical lift to make that kind of strike either. And don't forget, for every soldier you put in uniform, that is one less person who is contributing to your economy, who is working. War is wasteful. And let's say you did win a war against Israel. What do you get? Israel effectively has no natural resources. It's the only darn place in the Mideast without oil. Israel has a knowledge economy like the U.S. And if you kill or displace all the knowledge workers, all you have left are a bunch of people who don't know how to do anything and are demanding handouts. Sometimes freedom means the freedom to starve. So now it's the Colin Powell Pottery Barn rule. You liberated the heck out of Israel, now you got to rebuild the country. Didn't factor that one into the equation, did you? So when all of these Arab soldiers come home, they're all going to want jobs and veterans benefits. So now you have to pay even more money on top of the money that you're paying to rebuild this new Palestine state. And if you don't treat your returning veterans right, you could have another insurgency. I mean, these young men just experienced combat. They know how to use guns and work as a team, and now they don't have a job. How well did that work out in Iraq when the U.S. disbanded the Iraqi army? So I don't see a ground invasion happening for a number of reasons. Now that leaves us with the most likely option of, of how a regional war could actually break out. And it looks a lot like the 23rd episode of the first season of Star Trek. Stay with me, stay with me. I'm not a Trekkie, but I dated a girl who was. And there was this episode of Star Trek, the original series, when the Enterprise comes upon a planet that was engaged in a constant war with another planet in its solar system. The episode was called A Taste of Armageddon. I actually had to look that one up. And the idea was that these two planets had been at war for so long that they decided to create a joint computer simulation to simulate the war. If you became a casualty in the simulation, you would have to go to a disintegration chamber in real life and, and be killed. And the idea was that uh, they could continue having this war for centuries, but it wouldn't actually damage any infrastructure, so both planets' cultures could still go on. Now, this had the effect of perpetuating the war because there would never actually be a winner. So what I could see is a conflict where for the next five years, 10 years, 20 years, Israel and Iran just lob missiles at each other periodically, and it just becomes part of the background of life. Israel shoots most of them down at great cost, but once in a while, one gets through, blows up a neighborhood. Iran lets most of Israel's missiles through, unless it's about to hit a piece of critical infrastructure, because every Israeli strike on Iran is another political win on the world stage. And, um, you know, I Iran isn't going to cry if it, if it kills a couple of civilians, but they will video record it and show it to the world. So both sides then use the, this missile technology uh, to uh, develop better missiles and better air defenses. And the only people who lose are the civilians that get blown up. But what else is new? So that's kind of how I could see a wider war breaking out in the Middle East. Not a ground war, but basically a tennis match with missiles. Uh, I don't foresee any kind of ground invasion. Essentially, nobody in the Arab world has logistical tail or political will to do that. So once again, guys, if you want to support the channel, buy a t-shirt or a hoodie from Bunker Branding. And thank you guys so much for watching. In a world where fashion meets firepower, where style becomes strategy, it's time to gear up for the ultimate mission with Bunker Branding. Introducing the Rock Out With Your Chalk Out t-shirt, a tribute to the fearless air cavalry. Feel the adrenaline rush as you don the pride of the skies. For those of you who dare from the air, precision and power unite when you think outside the bomb. And don't miss our Live Laugh Launch t-shirts for Patriot and High Mars, because sometimes defending freedom means bringing the thunder. Finally, for the true defender of the seas, we present Department of the Boat People. Sail with honor and show your allegiance to the world's mightiest maritime force. With these shirts, hoodies, and stickers, along with the tow missile, landmines, and drone warfare. These aren't just shirts, they're statements. They're your way of saying I stand for strength, unity, and style. Get yours at Bunker Branding today.